going on guys, it's Surfcast in the Island and today I'm going to be talking about the common mistakes I've observed and people that have come to me about these um, you know, common mistakes, have you will. So the first one I'm going to talk about is rod and reel pairing and this is essential for whether you're a beginner, intermediate or on the higher end of the spectrum. So to the right of me I have a rod that I've actually used, a rod and reel that I've used in previous lectures. This is my 7 foot cousin's medium light with my Soltis Back Bay 3000 on it. And when you're looking for a rod and reel pairing, I've spoken about this in previous lectures, you want something that's going to cater to your needs and what you're gonna be doing, whether it's plugging, bait fishing, surf casting, jetty fishing, you get the gist. So, a basic test you can perform, have you will, would be called, I call it the um, balance test. So pretty much you just take your index finger or multiple fingers and rest it right above the cork or right on the cork within that area and you can see here that the rod and reel pretty much balances perfectly now that's what you want you want the rod and reel to counterbalance the setup meaning you don't want too heavy of a rod on too light of a reel and too heavy of a reel on too light of a rod you want to find you know you call it the yin yang the balance whatever you want to call it um, and that'll give you the most efficient setup in terms of um, casting, you know, retrieving the plug, catching fish, being efficient in that matter. Um, you know, if you put too heavy of a reel, you'll run into other problems I'll talk about next, and so on. So in terms of my plugging setups and my lighter surf casting setups, I'll run anywhere from a 3,000 spinning reel, which this is, but it's more like a 4,000 for many other compared companies on a seven foot rod all the way up to about you know a nine foot which you would see on my Genesis and my VR50 which is very similar to a 4000 size reel. Um, what you want to take into consideration with the reel and rod pairing as well is the distance between your 40 guide and the spool of your reel. Pretty much what that means is if you have too choked of a guide you want to use a smaller spool. The wider spool um, regardless of the real size is going to interfere and cause friction when you're casting so say if this 40 guy was choked I would go with a smaller you know maybe a three or two thousand size reel um, that's pretty much it another factor you want to take into consideration is the spool here and the distance between that and the tip of the rod because when you're turning a handle on, on a retrieve, you have to make up for that distance when you're reeling in and so on and so forth. If you have, um, let's say for example, if you have too small of a reel on too big of a rod, say you have a 4,000 size reel on a 10 foot rod, you have to crank that much faster to make up from that tip to the spool. Um, if you have too big of a reel on too small of a rod, you'll run into the opposite problem. You'll have too big of a spool like I mentioned, and it'll cause friction with the 40 guide. You won't get an efficient cast. It'll be much more difficult to, in terms of um, mobility, moving around. It won't be as comfortable in your hand. So that pretty much sums up how I would approach um, choosing a rod and reel combination that'd be suitable for your needs. You don't want to go too big on too light or too light on too big. So that's pretty much where I'm coming from. So another common mistake I will be talking about is um, spooling a reel. Uh, in specific, I'm going to be talking about spinning reels like I have here. Um, you know, when you're spooling a spinning reel, you want the line to be on there, as I would call, like wood. So when you roll your finger along the spool, the line shouldn't roll with it. It should lay nice and flat on the spool. If it does otherwise, that means you didn't apply enough pressure spooling your reel. And that could be a problem in terms of causing knots, uh, loops in your line, wind knots, whatever you want to call it. But in terms of spooling your reel besides keeping constant, consistent pressure, you want to spool it in terms of having the spool here in the same direction as the reel, as it's designed, have you will. So if you have a spinning reel, you want the line coming off the spool in a circular motion like this, right? On the other hand, if you had a bait cast or a conventional when you're spooling it, you're gonna want it to go 
and roll off the spool straight because of the shape of it. It's it's like um, a roll of toilet paper, how it keeps coming off and off and off and off. That's how conventional is. On the other hand, like I mentioned, the spinning reel, it's, it's spinning around this way in a circular motion coming off the spool. So if you were to do it this way, like a conventional rolling off, that's what's going to cause what you would call wind knots or, you know, loops in your line. And that's not good because you just wasted 30 bucks on a spool and probably half your spool is gone. Um, that's just another tip I found because I made that mistake myself and uh, you just you really don't want to do that. So another common mistake I've encountered amongst people and I've done myself, I, um, I hold myself victim to it, is how you tie up your tactical angler's clip. As you can see here, the knot is right above the arm that's pointed at a 45 degree angle and that's very important. Many guys, or I shouldn't say many guys, but some people have tied it I've seen like this where the knot is just above the arm that's pointed at a 90 degree angle. That's a problem in the sense that if a fish makes a run and turns, this knot can pull through the 45 degree arm as you can see here. And you can lose your fish and you can lose your plug, you know, $20, $30 down the drain. You don't want that. Now, on the other hand, if you rig it like this, like I had before with the 45 degree arm right below the knot, if the fish were to make a run into the clip, it would literally have to do a 360 to get this part loose. So it would be, it's virtually impossible for these clips to fail if you use them properly and you know how to use them. Um, and that's pretty much it. I've never had a problem with TA clips bending out or whatnot or a fish ripping a knot off of the arm. And uh, yeah, just another simple tip, but you know, it can make the world of a difference. So another common mistake that I've seen and heard of is how people take on and off the fat cow or otter tail jig strips off their bucktails. So um, this is a little shout out, Joey Leggio. I know you like these, these are uh, fat cow jig strips. Um, they're great, he uses them on the boat, bucktailing bass in the canals. I use them bucktail on the open beach as well as the boat. Um, so you're going to take your fat cow strip like this. This is an eel tail, I believe, a white eel tail, like this. You can see it has the pin through for the hook. And you have your bucktail connected to your TA clip, which I did before. All you're going to do, let me pull the hairs back. You're going to pin it through that hole in the bottom, as you can see, like that. Now you're fishing, you're fishing, you're fishing, whatever, whatnot. Say you want to um, change colors or whatnot. Um, a lot of guys will pull the jig strip like this. All you're going to do, whether this is fat cow or otter tail, it's going to tear your jig strip and it's going to be beyond repair. You're not going to be able to use it again. So if you have a barb like I do, I keep barbs on all my single hooks like so. All my treble hooks I take off the barbs. Um, if you have a barb, you're going to want to spin the bait in the opposite direction, like this. Then you're going to pull, comes right off. Again, if you were to do it the other way, if the bait's like this on here and pull back, you're just going to tear your bait. It's going to be a disaster. Uh, not a disaster, I'm kind of over exaggerating. But you get the idea. If you want to change a bait, you know, change a color and whatnot, because these things don't dry out like pork rinds, and that's why I like them so much. But again, that's just another tip I would use in terms of uh, preserving your bait, and you know, all these little things make a difference in terms of efficiency, saving money, and catching fish, of course. So another common mistake I've seen and done myself is how you hook your bait onto your rod at the end of a, a trip or if you're moving spots. So I'm going to show you with a plug as opposed to a bucktail. So we're going to take the bucktail off the TA clip, slide it up the 45 degree arm like this. I'm going to put on a skitter walk. This is a perfect example. It's got a lot of hooks, a lot of trouble. It's very dangerous to the guys if you do this the wrong way. So we're going to clip it on, pull it, we're good. Now let's take our rod. Again, this is my seven foot cousins. We're going to reel up to the 40 guide. Now, you have your skitter walk, your plug, whatever you want. Some guys, and I've seen it, 
will put the treble hook on the ring of the 40 guide or whatever guide you have. Over time, what this will cause is a chafing on the inside of the ceramic guide, and that's bad because it'll crack the guide, it'll slice through your line like a hot knife through butter. You don't want that. And the bigger problem is if you damage a guide below the tip, you're going to have to send it in. They're not going to be able to do it in the shop as they would a tip, and yada, yada, yada. It's going to take weeks to, uh, weeks to repair, and you really don't want that. So, your other option, or the only other option I would say, is to hook that bait on the frame, like that. Again, it's gonna, it'll, it'll slice up the frame a little bit, but it's not going to crack your ceramic guide. And that's the most important thing about this. Another thing, and I prefer this more than leaving a bait on a rod, is I'll take the bait off. Skitter walk. I'll actually connect the TA clip to the line itself, and I'll show you guys how to do that. So I'm going to need a little line. You can take your TA clip like this, and just how you hook a bait, this is going to be the trickiest part. You're just going to hook it onto the line like that. You reel it up, boom. No hooks, no damage. The TA clip is just resting on the line and right in front of the 40 guide. And that's a beautiful thing. You're not going to damage the rod and everything's going to be preserved the way it's supposed to. Um, this pretty much concludes this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please like, comment, and hit that subscribe button. Thank you.